in the depths of the mind. I've encountered countless patients in my years as a psychologist, each with their unique enigmas and untold stories in my Boston practice, of which I often sink and discuss now that I am retired. But none are quite like the man who occupies my thoughts these days, a man who arrived shrouded in an aura of utter mystery, which even all these years later has not yet receded. He was a patient of mine, admitted to our facility without a name, and it was becoming increasingly clear that something uncommon had befallen him. He was devoid of any memories, a clean slate, with no trace of identity or history. Nothing seemed wrong with him. He even was fully cooperative and responded to the best of his abilities to all our queries. Who he was, where he came from, and the events that had etched themselves into the fabric of his mind, none of it was here. You might think this amnesia is a common affliction, a predictable consequence of some traumatic event. This is incorrect. Not only is amnesia very rare, but this case defies all norms. Standard treatments, therapies, and medication have yielded little, if any, progress. He stands before us an enigma, a man with a past as elusive as the mist that blankets our facilities on somber evenings. This situation has led me down an unconventional path. Faced with a patient so profoundly lost within the labyrinths of his own consciousness, I've decided to explore the depths of his psyche through the old practice of hypnosis. I know today hypnosis has a bad name, but in those days, most people believed it to be, though it was quite mystical, a useful tool of treatment. It is a journey into the uncharted territories of the human mind, one that might just unearth the forgotten pieces of his life. My intentions are simple, to guide him back to himself, to uncover the layers of his lost existence, to provide him with the answers he so desperately needs and seeks. Yet, as I prepare for our first session, I can't help but feel a sense of trepidation. In the vast expanse of his subconscious, what shadows and secrets lie in wait? What truths will we unearth, and at what cost? As I prepare to delve into this enigma, I can shake the feeling that this journey may take us both to places we never anticipated. As the patient settled down into the plush chair, his gaze fixed on some distant point in the room, a now undeniable calm enveloped him. His breast grew slower and deeper, matching the rhythm of his now tranquil heart. Soft, ambient light based the room, casting reassuring gentle shadows across the walls. It was as if he had entered a profound state of of serenity. With each number counted, starting from 10, his consciousness seemed to recede further into the depths of his mind. 10, drifting deeper. 9, letting go. 8, my voice remained a hush, guiding him gently into the recesses of his psyche. By the time I counted down to 1, he had reached a state of profound relaxation. It was as if his mind, once a void or chasm, had transformed into a serene and undisturbed lake. In this state, the block had melted away. He was now responsive, able to delve into the deep concealed vault of his forgotten memories, a willing participant to the sharing of his secrets and his concealed past. Though he was sleeping, he spoke clearly, as if describing his actions as one of another person. The following text is either the direct wording of the patient or, to the best of my knowledge, the content of his speech. In the year 1926, I found myself in the eerie landscape of Imswish, Massachusetts, embarking on a journey guided by an enigmatic instruction of my late great-uncle Zacharias. With a set of three keys and a cryptic direction in hand, I navigated with my motor car the shadowy, desolate countryside. The air was heavy as I pondered the purpose behind my uncle's particular bequest, the wheels of my car turning on the lonely pass ahead. My uncle was, and always had been, an ancient, aged, and bizarre man. He possessed an aura of wisdom, yet remained ignorant of most of the modern world's advancements. His wealth was evident, yet he bore no identifiable profession or occupation. As I followed his instructions down the road, I could not help 
but wonder about the secrets he held and the reasons behind his eccentricities. The keys in my hand and the weight of his legacy added to the growing puzzle, urging me to the walls of the antique manor that now awaited my arrival. The letter he had left me was laconic, urging me to approach the property with unwavering zeal and to do whatever was necessary. Further instructions would be found inside. The brevity of the note mirrored the enigmatic nature of my great uncle Zacharias, leaving me with a sense of urgency and curiosity. As I read those words, I felt a strange mixture of apprehension and determination, realizing that I was about to embark on a journey. Yet within its concise words, the letter, which contained bizarre facts, piqued my intrigue. My uncle's recorded date of birth that the notary had given me was 1802, a detail that seemed to defy logic and suggested a clerical error. Adding to this enigma, he had been buried in a private funeral devoid of any family members, a fact that was awfully queer was a nearby branch of the family. The summons itself was delivered by a lawyer named Gustav Johnson, hailing of the esteemed Providence Office of Parker and Everton, lawyers that are still practicing today. The piece of the puzzle were falling into place, albeit forming a picture that only deepened the mystique surrounding my uncle's legacy. The property stood isolated, almost remote, seemingly cut off from the rest of the world yet it held the presence of a great old house. Three stories boasting the architectural charm of a pre-revolutionary era. My mother, who had ventured there as a child, recounted stories of a small village and fields that were said to have surrounded the manor, although she had never laid eyes on either. Instead, the manor stood enshrouded by thick woodland, as if time itself had enclosed it in a cocoon. The very side of the house against the backdrop of those whispering woods left me with an eerie feeling. Even in my mother's youth, its many rooms were far from being inhabited, and the air within hung heavy with a palpable sense of neglect. It became evident that without a dedicated staff of servants, such a sprawling household could n neither be run nor maintained. As she had stepped through the grand corridors, dust-covered furniture and faded tapestries, whispering stories of days long gone, had covered the ornate walls, and the echo of, of the past seemed to resonate through the empty halls, urging me to hasten my course. The patient went at length about many topics, his education, ambitions, yet the manner in his uncle came back normal it was a nexus of his psychosis as a boy the patient who named himself kenneth held a vivid memory of his parents engaged in a conversation as they drove their carriage away from the property for the last time the recollection like a snapshot frozen in time captured the essence of that moment when his family's connection to the estate was severed the weight of that memory mingled with the present as kenneth found himself for tracing the past he had taken back to a place that held his great uncle's vast legacy. Unease lingered in the air as Kenneth recalled the hushed tones of his parents during that carriage ride. Their unease agreement was clear. The family should never set foot on the property again. The memory of their cautious conversation added another layer of intrigue to the enigma that surrounded his great uncle. What had transpired in the past to warrant such a decision? The more Kenneth spoke, the more the facts became unclear. The day before the very departure, the young boy had aimlessly wandered the halls of the old dusty house, seeking something to capture his attention. In his explorations, he stumbled upon a forgotten library, a treasure trove of all volumes that lined the shelves, the scent of aged parchment and leather-filled air as he gazed at the collection before him. Each book seemed to hold within its pages a whispering of knowledge, beckoning him to open Opened them and explored their secret content. Among the sea of old occult volumes, one stick black leather bound book captured the boy's attention. Unlike the others, this book bore no title on its spine. Only a star encased in a circle adorned its surface. The mysterious symbol intrigued him. He had never seen any like that before drawing him closer until his finger brushed the textured leather. An irresponsible urge tugged at him, 
pushing him to take the book down from the shelf and immerse himself in its contents. Little did he know that his seemingly innocuous action would set him on the path that would forever alter the course of his life. As his fingers brushed the book's surface, a deep voice resonated within the library. You have good taste, Master Kenneth. It so happens to be my favorite book too. Startled, Kenneth turned around to find himself face to face with no other than Zacharias, the very same great uncle he had been instructed to avoid the next day. This entrance left him speechless, his heart racing. What is it? The young Lockwood asked, his perplexity evident. Oh, it's not a thing. It is a means to almost any end, Zacharias replied, a minuscule smile playing on the corner of his mouth and his eyes. The cryptic response left only a deepening gash in Kenneth's confusion, leaving him to wonder about the significance of the book. Can I read it, uncle? The young man asked, his curiosity unabated. I wish you could, but it isn't Latin, and today's damn schools don't teach anything so useful, Zacharias replied with a touch of wistfulness. The realization that the book held knowledge inaccessible due to the passage of time and the changing tides in the education further fueled Kenneth's intrigue. Kenneth fell silent, absorbing the weight of Zacharias's words. The air was heavy in the gravity of the moment as his great uncle spoke once more. One day I will teach you the secrets of the universe, and everything will be yours, little Kenneth. The promise both tantalized and enigmatic hung in the air like a beacon of possibility. Kenneth's heart raced with a mixture of anticipation and trepidation. The words had echoed in his mind so many times, leaving him with a sense that the tale of his family and the secrets he was at the cusp of uncovering would reshape the world in ways he could scarcely imagine. When Kenneth had described the encounter with his great uncle to his parents, they had exchanged uneasy glances before excusing themselves. The atmosphere grew tense, and the decision was made. His father, mother, and Kenneth would leave the next day. As they departed the manor, the weight of unspoken arguments hung in the air. The carriage rolled away from the estate, leaving behind not only the grand old house, but also the promises that would come to define Kenneth's journey. Years had passed, and Kenneth hadn't revisited those memories. The encounter with his great uncle had faded into the background, becoming more like a dream over the past 11 years. However, the bent and torturous handwritten letter from his uncle had rekindled these long dormant memories. But it was the sight of the handwritten letter from his uncle that acted as a catalyst, igniting the flames of these ancient thoughts buried deep within him. The careful crafted script on the wizard parchment seemed to carry not just words, but a connection to a time long ago, pulling him back into the enigmatic world he had once encountered as a young boy. From the vault of time, he had emerged with a renewed sense of purpose. His mission was clear, to delve once again into the house, determined to decipher the cryptic messages his uncle had left behind and claim his legacy. Despite his father's warning to simply sell the property from afar, deeming it nothing more than a ruin, Kenneth felt a magnetic pull. The black leather book seemed to beckon him, resonating with the untold stories of the past that remain shrouded in mystery. Ignoring the cautious advice, he couldn't ignore the growing curiosity that urged him to step into the shadowy corridors once again and unearth the truths that had been concealed long ago. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows across the narrow country road, Kenneth's progress felt frustratingly slow. The surroundings seemed to conspire against his journey, as if time itself were elongating the past before him. Regrettably, he found himself lost in the labyrinth countryside. The absence of clear signs and the limitation of relying on recollections of a nine-year-old boy left him without reliable guidance, ensnaring him in a frustrating web of uncertainty. The late November weather held a bitter cold in the air, while the feeble sunlight did little to dispel the gloom. Kenneth couldn't help but question his decision as he navigated through this desolate landscape. 
landscape. Why had he abandoned the comfort of his warm room at the university, leaving behind his scholarly pursuits in the field of New England humanities for this uncertain quest? The juxtaposition of his present predicament against the familiar of academical pursuits tugged at his thoughts, casting doubts on his motivations. Having delved in the world of Latin and even dabbled as a novice in the field of alienism studies, Kenneth's skill set had expanded since his childhood, and the encounter with his mysterious uncle and book. Was the book he encountered repository of forgotten secrets holding within it pages of a lost history? Could it be an outcast gospel of the Bible containing knowledge that had been intentionally cast aside? Such question loomed before Kenneth as he pondered the possibilities, his journey through the countryside taking on a new urgency fueled by mysteries that awaited him within the manor walls. Zacharias Lockwood, at the time of his passing, had probably been around 75 to 80 years old. He was a renowned and prominent alienist, his expertise in the field widely acknowledged. Beyond his medical pursuits, he had also established himself as a collector of diverse artifacts, as indicated by his multifaceted interests that deepened the enigma surrounding him. Zacharias Lockwood's field of influence extended far and wide, his contacts spanning Eastern Europe, India, and China. A polyglot, he had mastered numerous languages, many of which had long fallen into obscurity. His scholarship pursuits were diverse and they were impressive, ranging from alchemy and divination to astrology. Of course, he was celebrated in his time as an esteemed alienist, known for his groundbreaking work in that field. The tapestry of knowledge and expertise painted a picture of a man deeply immersed in esoteric disciplines, leaving a legacy that resonated far beyond the boundary of his years. Every facet of of Zacharias's persona seemed to base in contradiction. His wealth, knowledge, encompassed fields that modern science had long rendered obsolete. Yet he persisted in the pursuit of understanding them. While the world progressed on a relentless forward march, he remained steadfast in his commitment to learning, a testament to the unquenchable thirst for knowledge that defined him. The strip of buildings along the road pulled Kenneth out of his contemplation, signaling his arrival at a hamlet. The sight broke the rhythm of his thoughts, grounding him in the present as he approached the cluster of structures that stood in stark contrast to the desolate countryside he had been navigating. The buildings appeared weathered and aged giving the impression of abandonment, were it not for the warm lights flickering in their windows. The unexpected sight prompted Kenneth to ease his pace as he cautiously approached the structures, intrigued by the paradoxical atmosphere they exuded. Suddenly, a rush of memory flooded over Kenneth. The hamlet marked the last trace of civilization before the journey to Lockwood Manor. He vividly recalled the existence of a shop in this very location. With a sense of curiosity, he decelerated to a slow cruise, his eyes scanning the dilapidated surroundings. To his astonishment, the shop still stood, though it had weathered the years poorly. Broken windows and missing porch boards gave it an air of profound neglect. Amidst the wreckage, a dirty sign lay haphazardly on a dilapidated crate. Its flanking patent formed the words open in fading letters. Bringing his car to a stop, Kenneth parked and let out a deep breath. The abrupt shift from the realm of thought and memory back to reality left him acutely aware of his hunger. The pangs of hunger seemed to reawaken in force as he sat in the hamlet, hungry and disoriented, grappling with challenges of his journey. In mere moments, Kenneth crossed the muddy road and, improvising makeshift plans, planks of wood stepped into the shop. The worn floorboards creaked under his weight as he entered the dimly lit interior. The smell of aged wood and dust mingled with the faint aroma of forgotten merchandise. Much as he remembered, the shop appeared worn and poorly maintained. It was a relic of the past, evoking memories of his boyhood. His, his parents had often referred to it as outdated and old-fashioned, though these terms seemed euphemistic and polite in comparison to the facts. The reality was stark. 
The shop stood as a decrepit slum, a place that had seen better days long ago. The shopkeeper, a figure etched in his memory, came into view. A slim man, his figures recurred with wrinkles that spoke of years gone by. Yet what remained unchanged was a crooked smile that adorned his face. A smile that seemed to embody the passage of time, the stories it held. As Kenneth entered, the shopkeeper's gaze rose to meet the newcomer. His eyes narrowed slightly behind the lens of his sick silver spectacles. The glasses seemed to magnify the wisdom and curiosity that lingered in his eyes, as if he had seen countless faces and stories cross the threshold of his humble establishment. Oh, a Lockhood boy, he greeted without a moment's hesitation or pause. The words rolled off his tongue, carrying with them a sense of recognition that seemed to transcend time. Hello, Sir Kenneth replied, his surprise evident. He couldn't help but inquire. How can you tell? His curiosity was peaked by the shopkeeper's immediate recognition, wondering if there was something about his demeanor or appearance that gave away his identity. Oh, I've lived in these parts for 68 years. Of course I can tell one family from another, the shopkeeper explained with a chuckle. He then shifted his attention and asked, how can I help you on this fine day? The conversation flowed with ease of someone who had seen passing generations, a testament of deep roots that bound this man to the community. I'm afraid I found myself rather lost. Kenneth admitted. I came this way quite by accident, actually. I was looking for Lockwood Manor. The shopkeeper's eyes seemed to focus as the words left Kenneth's lips. Sensing the man's attention, Kenneth continued. I must also confess that I am quite famished. I have not had a proper meal all day. Lockwood Manor? That old place, the shopkeeper began, his tone carrying a mix of reminiscence and caution. No one lives there anymore. It's in the heart of the deep wood, near the old village. Wild country. I tells you, sir, no place for a proper gentleman like yourself. He continued. When it comes to food, I've got all you have need. Without waiting for a response, the shopkeeper turned and disappeared into a back room. As he pondered, a question arose in Kenneth's mind. How could Lockwood Manor be abandoned when Zacharias had passed away a mere two years ago? Returning with several bags of foodstuffs and provision, the shopkeeper's practicality and hospitality were evident. As he set down the supplies, he posed a question. What business? would you have in Lockwood Manor? Well, you're looking at the new owner of its walls, lands and holdings, my good man, Kenneth replied, a mixture of pride and a smile in his words. The announcement carried a sense of accomplishment and a touch of anticipation. The shopkeeper's gaze fixed on Kenneth once more, his eyes seeming to peer deeper, as if seeking something beyond the surface. Are you kin of Zacharias, my boy? His voice had changed, taking a lower, deeper resonance that seemed to carry a weight of its own. The question question hung in the air, pregnant with implications and unspoke connections. He happened to be my uncle, Kenneth answered, and he could not help but inquire. Did you know him, sir? The old man's expression seemed to soften, his features displaying a mix of emotions. No, I've never met the man, he replied, his tone tinged with a sense of respect. But he was, well... There are two Lockwood families in this country. Those of the manor and those of the river. I just assumed you were the river kind. And we don't typically have much business with the manor kind, if you get my words. I don't know that. Kenneth admitted, intrigued by the distinction. He, he inquired further. Can you tell me where I can find my family on the riverside? The desire to explore different facets of his family had awakened in Kenneth's thoughts. I don't think it's a good idea, the shopkeeper replied his tone cautious. The hesitation his word hinted at tensions that existed between the two branches of the Lockwood family. It was as if the old man's response carried with it a silent caution, urging Kenneth to tread carefully. The shopkeeper continued, his voice carrying a somber tone. They will not think of you as kin, handing over the supplies, he added. Here are your provisions. That will be a nickel. Kenneth's desire for information persisted, and he ventured further. Could you tell me where the man is. The shopkeeper's expression shifted, a veil of concern darkening his features as he took a step back. In a moment, Kenneth's hopes of finding the manners seemed to dwindle, leaving him with a sense of frustration and uncertainty. I haven't been there in years. I was only nine the last time I visited, Kenneth confessed, a note of hopelessness in his voice. The passing of time had dulled his memories, leaving him without a clear recollection of the way to the manor. The realization that he stood on the cusp 
of a journey without a map or guide seemed to hang in the air, casting a shadow of doubt over his quest. Finally, the man spoke. His voice tinged with a mix of urgency and concern. Oh, I see, boy. You'll get nothing there. You shouldn't be there. It's a ruin. Panic seemed to creep into his expression. Kenneth persisted, his tone resolute. What road can I follow? The shopkeeper, taking another step back, replied in a hushed tone. Just go down the road to Arkham and enter the high wall. The gate is locked. He seemed to hesitate, his words trailing off into uncertainty as he grappled with what more he could say. As Kenneth turned to leave, the shopkeeper's voice called out from the distant position. Final reminder, don't forget your foodstuffs. I'll be closing up shop after this, and I won't be open for a while. His words carried a sense of finality, as if the meeting between them had caused a deep change inside the man. With a renewed sense of skepticism regarding this enterprise, Kenneth returned to his car, his thoughts muddled by the encounter at the hamlet. The realization that the closest inhabitants seemed to harbor a sense of fear or avoidance towards his family left him further unsettled. As hunger gnawed at him again, he took the time to prepare a simple lunch his actions carrying a sense of normalcy amidst of the mysteries that surrounded him. However, his attention was soon diverted by a surprising sight. Through the window, he observed the shopkeeper closing and boarding up his shop, locking it securely before hurrying down the streets and disappearing from view. The sight left Kenneth with a deep sense and feeling of unease. The sight of the shop, which had remained open for over a decade, now closed and barred, struck Kenneth as particularly unusual. This May mingled with curiosity as he pondered the sudden change in the shopkeeper's behavior. With a sense of determination, he recognized that he needed to gather more information and find his lockwood kin from the river. That would be the next step in untangling the intricate threads of his family history and the mystery of the manor. The hour was growing late, and weariness settled on Kenneth. Determined to press on, he followed the wall, his car navigating the narrow road as he moved forward with a sense of purpose. The darkness of the night seemed to envelop him, the distant outline of the wall guiding him as he continued to journey towards the enigmatic, awkward manner. The forest around him grew denser, reducing visibility. Unexpectedly, to his left, he caught sight of a tall gate crafted from black painted steel it formed a formidable barrier the doors were sealed shut by a heavy chain and lock a stark indication that the pass ahead was not easily traversed a prominent l emblem marked the gate as the entry to the Lockwood lands. The surroundings were shrouded in darkness, the thick canopy of the trees obscuring the moonlight and the stars above. The sense of isolation was palpable, as if it were the forest, as if the forest held its secrets close, guarding the pass into the heart Lockwood estates. Exiting the car, Kenneth's headlight cast a focused beam of light as he approached the gate. He took the colossal key in hand, its weight and size a testament of the significance of the barrier had secured. Turning the key in the padlock, he could feel the resistance of time and weather against the metal. Up close, the padlock appeared partly rusted, its surface marred by patches of moth that spoke of the passage of time and neglect. With determination, Kenneth finally pushed the gate open using his entire body to overcome the resistance. The creak of the metal echoed through the silent night, the sound a harbinger of his entrance into the realm of the Lockwood Estates. As the gate swung open, he stood at the threshold, posed to step into the unknown and unravel the mysteries that awaited him within the dense shadows of the manor grounds. The path stretched ahead, long and straight, its gravel road swallowed by the luxuriant foliage that enveloped it. The dense growths of plants and trees seemed to close in, creating a tunnel of obscurity that guided Kenneth deeper into the heart of the Lockwood estate. The journey continued, each second revealing a world that remained unseen for years. After a few minutes of navigating the dark woodland pass, the automobile emerged into a clearing. Beyond him lay the grand ring of pavement in front of the manor, framed by its twin staircases. The manor itself loomed before him, a tower presence that seemed to stretch upwards to meet the sky and the surrounding tree branches. Dark and burning, it held an aura of greatness even in this dim light. The journey that had begun as a mere idea in his mind 
had led Kenes to this pivotal moment, face to face with the heart of his legacy. The ground beneath him was strewn with fallen branches, a carpet of moss-covered debris and overgrown grass. The appearance of neglect was striking, as if the manor had been abandoned far longer than the mere two years since Zacharias's passing. Climbing the staircase, Kenneth, Kenneth felt the weight of time in the worn and steep steps. Reaching the entrance, he was met with a door of dark carved wood, its intricate pattern combining sharp angles and lax curves in an intriguing motif. Pushing aside the rotten leaves and tree branches that had amassed in front of the twin doors, he was poised to step across the threshold in a world that held both familiar memories and uncharted mysteries. He felt an instant of foreboding fear, which she ignored. The key initially resisted, as if the manor itself was reluctant to open its secrets to just anyone. But after a forceful twist and a resonant click, very metallic, the key relented and the lock opened. Kenneth pulled the heavy door open, his efforts combining with his uneven footing making him slip slightly. The great interior lay before him, revealing in all its glory a vast entry hall, its marble floor covered in dirt sketched out beneath his gaze. Twin staircases once more led upwards, and corridors extended from the front, left, and right, creating a sense of endless possibility and exploration within the manor's expansive confines. So the distant fading light of day cast long shadows as Kenneth struggled to his feet and crossed the threshold of the manor. The realization that he had arrived so late, combined with the absence of moonlight to reach the first story windows, left him in near darkness. He passed through the arc above the door, stepping into the obscure haze of the interior. The darkness threatened to engulf him, but the feeble illumination from the two small windows far above the room managed to pierce through the gloom casting faint pools of light that revealed fragments of the room's features. He had been foolish not to think of bringing any light source. With his limited memory, as a guide, Kenneth pondered where he might find a source of light. Recollections of this place were shrouded in partial darkness, and his memory had always been tinged with obscurity. He remembered his father's complaints about the immense size of the manor, remarking that it was too vast to be properly cleaned and illuminated. The echoes of his father's words only deepened the sense of mystery and solitude that hung in the air. In the obscurity, Portraits and artworks remained hidden, awaiting the touch of light to reveal their form. Recalling a candelabra and matches that had once sat atop an ornate chest of drawers on the second floor landing, Kenneth set off across the room and ascended the stairs once more. As he climbed, he noticed that, that most of the doors were closed and the furniture was shrouded in covers. The atmosphere was undeniably grim, lending an air of desolation to the grandeur of the manor. The ascent of the stairs was slow, his steps guided more by touch than sight. A glimmer of silver caught his attention, leading him to the candelabra. Feeling around, he located candles atop the, its three arms. While the wax was worn and greasy, two candles, two candles were still usable while the third was a burnt-out husk melted onto its arm. Clutching the remaining candles in his left hand, his other hand sought the matches or a ladder, determined to bring forth a flicker of light to pierce the persuasive darkness. Papers laid scattered across the counter, a chaotic display of disarray. Yet in the midst of the disorder, there was nothing to ignite the candles and pierce the gloom. Suddenly, Canis's foot made contact with something on the floor. He lowered himself off and reached for it, discovering a small box. Rattling it gently, he heard a faint sound of a few matches inside. With a sense of anticipation, he selected a match and struck it against the rough surface of the box. The first match snapped and broke, but the second match ignited with a bright flame. As the flame danced before him, he couldn't help but think that it must have been an old sulfurous match, its acrid scent and vivid light a reminder of the past. Sweating and panting from the physical and emotion exertion, 
Kenneth considered his next move. In the flickering candlelight, he scanned his surroundings, pondering the best course of action as he stood on the landing of the second floor, the manor's secrets still waiting to be unveiled. With an extra supply of candles and the remaining matches tucked safely in his pockets, Kenneth surveyed his surroundings. In the bubble of light that the candles provided, he could see only a fraction of the room, while sick penumbra shrouded everything else in a veil of obscurity. The manor's vast interior stretched out before him, and he felt like an explorer in the heart of an ancient and enigmatic labyrinth. With unshaken determination, Kenneth made up his mind. He would make his way to the library, fully aware that his desire to peer into the forbidden content of that mysterious book held a touch of childless curiosity, yet above all else, it was this yearning that compelled him forward, driving him deeper into the heart of the manor. With a flicker of candlelight to guide his way, he embarked on a journey through the shadows of the past, where knowledge and mystery converged. Amidst the dimly lit corridors and the labyrinths layout of the manor, Kenneth found himself turned in circles, lost in the vastness of this place for what felt like an eternity. Yet, as if guided by fate or happenstance, he stumbled upon a door he knew all too well, his uncle's office. The room had always held an air of privacy, even formality, and its existence had been shrouded in a certain degree of restriction. Kenneth stood before the door to his uncle's office, his hand gripping the doorknob, but he hesitated. Memories of his uncle with burning and enigmatic eyes flashed through his mind, creating a sense of unease. However, he gathered his resolve and thought to himself, the man is dead. He cannot do me any harm anymore. With that acknowledgement, he turned the doorknob and pushed the door open, ready to explore the private sanctum that had long remained forbidden to him. Kenneth repeated the mantra in his head, allowing its soothing rhythm to calm his racing mind. For a minute or so, he went over it countless times, perhaps 50 in a rapid succession. It helped him regain his composure. It was unfit for a grown man to be afraid of the dark, his father's words echoed in his mind. If you cannot see, the neither can anything seeking you do you harm. The familiar advice brought a sense of grounding, as if it were a lifeline connecting him to the wisdom of his father and the past. Kenneth's moment of contemplation was interrupted by a sensation of hot wax dripping onto his hand, snapping him back to the present. Like one emerging from a dream. He swiftly opened the door and stepped inside. The room was much smaller than he had imagined, a contrast to the grandeur of the manor's exterior and interior. The walls were lined with shelves, each one crammed full of books. The focal point of the office, predictably, was a desk, but it was a desk buried beneath layer upon layer of books and manuscripts. It was evident that the desk had been continuously used over the years and had never been tidied up. Moving forward, Kenneth gingerly stepped on a layer of dusty open books. Among the sea of literature, he spotted a letter. It was encased in a purple envelope on top of the desk and all its contents. Starkly clean and untouched by the surrounding decay, the sight of a pristine letter amid the disarray was a stark contrast, piquing Kenneth's curiosity. Kenneth wasted no time and quickly took the letter in hand. The words to my true-born heir were written upon it, and he eagerly tore it open. His eyes scanned its contents by the flickering candlelight. To my heir, I bequeath all that I own upon the condition that you conduct the proper rights upon my demise. My soul is, according to my vision of the future, in the improper spheres. I have come unto an attack of vicious and traitorous men. You must make this right. In my abode, in my library, there is a book, thin and black, with a pentagram upon its spine. Take it to my entry hall. Open it to the marked page and read the underlined passage. Read it again and again. You will know when to stop. The manor and all it contains will be yours at that point. Zacharias Lockwood. Kenneth's eyes raced over the letter, absorbing its contents was a mixture of confusion and intrigue. The message from his late uncle, Zacharias, held an air of urgency and mystery. It spoke of bequeathing everything to Kenneth under the condition that the proper rites be conducted upon his uncle's demise, for his soul seemed to be in jeopardy. Zacharias's words directed him to a book in the library. 
described as a sin and black, with a pentagram on its spine. This book was obviously the book he had seen so many years ago. It was a cryptic message, and filled with curious instructions that left Kenneth with more questions than answers. As he finished reading, he could not help but wonder about the nature of these improper spheres and the mysterious book that held the key to his inheritance. Zacharias Lockwood's legacy was, was proving to be a labyrinth of riddles. The word rights and spheres echoed in Kenneth's mind, conjuring images of his uncle's outdated occult practices. While he was initially skeptical, the urgency and gravity of the letter gave him pause. There was something more to this than mere superstition. He knew he would have to delve into the pages of the mysterious black book with the pentagram on its spine. Despite his eagerness, the quest for answers and unraveling his uncle's legacy had begun in earnest. With the letter in hand, Kenneth left his uncle's office and made his way to the library. This time, the door was open and he stepped in without an instant's pause. As he approached the bookcase, where he knew the mysterious black book should be, he was met with a disconcerting sight. The book was not there. Panic and confusion welled up inside him, and he frantically looked around the room, trying to make sense of the situation. The book so crucial to the instructions in the letter had seemingly vanished, leaving him in a state of uncertainty and distress. His initial search for the book around the bookcase yielded no result. After a few seconds, he realized that it could be hidden somewhere else. On a table, a desk, or perhaps among a mound of books in some abandoned room within the manor. The task of locating this elusive volume was shaping up to be difficult and daunting. Determined to follow his uncle's instructions, he knew that he had no choice but to embark on this search, no matter how challenging it might prove to be. Standing in the small halo of light, Drenched in sweat and fatigue, Kenneth wiped his brow free of the dust that his frantic search had accumulated. His thoughts raced, trying to formulate a plan for proceeding. Then suddenly, from the darkness that surrounded him, a voice emerged. At first, Kenneth's confusion was so overwhelming that he failed to comprehend anything the voice said. It was as if someone was dwelling in the shadows of the house, a presence he had been unaware of till now. Kenneth's heart raced as he nearly dropped the candelabra in his near panic. When the voice spoke again, it was clear and commanding, calming his initial fright. No need to fret, boy. Come closer. I'm your kin, young Lockwood. Despite the reassurance, Kenneth couldn't shake the chill that coursed through him. There should have been no one here, and a deep, steady voice emerging from total darkness could only belong to a spirit from an unknown sphere. He tightened his grasp on the light he bore in his hand and cautiously moved forward, using the flickering flame as if it were some sort of protective shield. The encounter with this mysterious present had intensified the enigma that surrounded the manor, and Kenneth was determined to uncover the truce. In the heavy silence that followed, a few moments passed as Kenneth continued to advance through the unyielding darkness. Gradually, shapes began to take form, and he could discern the outline of a desk. Moving closer, he brought a large, high-backed chair into view. Sitting in that chair was a man whose voice he had heard. The man's appearance was striking. First, Kenneth noticed dark leather glove encased his hands, followed by his long, obscure overcoat. Finally, his face came into view. It was lined with the measures of age, bearing a well-trimmed beard and mustache. He had a full head of snowy white hair and dark eyes. In the daylight, those eyes might have appeared brown, but in this dimly lit space, they gave no appearance of color. Kenneth regarded the man he did not know was a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, wondering about his identity and the role he played in such a mysterious encounter. As both of them scrutinized each other, Kenneth found himself tongue-tied, his curiosity and apprehension rendering him momentarily speechless. It was the man who finally broke the silence. I would have wished to meet you in more illustrious circumstance, he began, pausing for a moment. Then, with a keen look into Kenneth's face, he continued, you really have the look. You're his spitting image. Kenneth Kenneth, taken aback by this cryptic statement, managed to find his voice and asked, Who do I look like? The man, instead of answering directly, pointed Kenneth to the right. Kenneth, carrying his light with him, walked one step and beheld a colossal portrait low on the wall. It appeared to be old, likely from the 18th century, perhaps earlier. And the man depicted in the portrait bore a striking resemblance to none other than himself. The revelation left Kenneth in a state of astonishment and intrigue. As he struggled to comprehend the significance of 
this uncanny resemblance. The old man sh chuckled slightly at his reaction, a wry amusement dancing on his eyes. He then spoke, shedding some light on the portrait's history. That's much older than you would think. It was the pride of the commonwealth before it became inconvenient. It was relegated to this abyss. As Kinnis continued to peer at the painting in disbelief, the man provided more context. The mind can go to strange places in such circumstances, he remarked. So I'll explain at least this simplest of points. This well was Zacharias. He was here for quite some time. This queer revelation that the portrait depicted his late uncle Zacharias only deepened the mystery surrounding this place. Candace's mind raced with questions, and he couldn't help but wonder what other secrets this manor held within its walls. Turning away from the ancient portrait, Candace couldn't shake the discomfort that it brought him. It seemed best to leave such relics in the merciful darkness of the past. He decided to address the man directly, asking, Who might you be, sir? A smile tugged at the corner of the man's lips as he replied, I'm your great uncle, through your mother's side. The name is Paul. The revelation of his identity only added another layer of complexity to this enigmatic encounter taking place within the manor. Kenneth's curiosity burning brighter, urging him to seek more answers. I know why you're here, boy. Paul said, his tone carrying a mixture of understanding and gravity. He's asked you to do something, to claim this place, this Lockwood legacy. He's dead. You're the master of this place, this ruin, this horde of rot and decay. Paul paused, and his words hung in the air, emphasizing the bleak state of the manor. Kenneth's inheritance was tainted by decay and neglect that had befallen it. The weight of responsibility in the strange task that lay ahead continued to loom over him, casting a long shadow on this newfound role as the master of the Lockwood legacy. Kenneth's confusion deepened as he looked into his uncle's eyes for guidance. What would you have me do, uncle? He inquired, his sense of bewilderment growing. The weight of the responsibility and the cryptic instructions he had received had left him uncertain about the next steps to take. Paul's response was unsettling and rapid. You're the master here, he declared. Burn it all. This house, this painting, starting with this book. In his right hand, Paul held a black-covered book. It displayed a pentagram on both its front cover and its spine. And despite the utter darkness of his clothing, the book seemed to absorb an even deeper shade of obscurity. The suggestion to destroy the very legacy he had inherited since sent shivers down Kenneth's spine, and he grappled with the enormity of the decision before. For a few seconds, he did nothing. Then, his hand instinctively reached for the cursed book, but Paul swiftly moved it out of his reach. It's my duty to tell you, Paul began, his voice carrying a, a sense of severity. This book here, it be cursed and no word from it should ever be spoken aloud. Kenneth's gaze met his uncle's eyes, and he pressed for more information. What is it exactly? he inquired. Once again, Paul answered without hesitation. Some things that should not be, like so many other things in this place. The weight of the manners, dark secrets, and enigmatic nature, and the enigmatic nature of the book hung heavily in the air, casting a pale light over the conversation. Candace's frustration and bewilderment grew as he sought answers from his great uncle. Uncle, you have known this for years. Why have you not destroyed all of this yourself? He queried, his gaze unwavering. Oh, what a good question, my boy. I've tried many times. Only the the master of this place may undo what has been done here. Paul responded with this cryptic explanation. Kenneth stood there, baffled by the implication of his uncle's words. Paul continued, his tone carrying a sense of urgency. Boy, you now tread where men fear to. Look at your watch, boy. Kenneth placed the candelabra down and pushed his sleeve to reveal his wristwatch. The watch seemed perfectly fine, and it displayed the time of one in the morning. One in the morning, one minute, and one second. The watch ticked forward, the smallest arm going forward a second. But the ticking of the watch seemed like a desperate attempt to escape the night's grim darkness, and it always returned a second before, a constant reminder that the eerie passage of time within the manor was seemingly stopped. What does it all mean? Kenneth muttered, his voice filled with confusion and frustration. As he looked around, he realized that Paul was no longer there. It was as if his great uncle had vanished into thin air, leaving Kenneth to grapple with the mysterious circumstances alone. Kenneth's sense of disorientation deepened 
as one of the candles died out at that moment. He reached into his pocket and retrieved another one, placing it on the candelabra's arm after lighting it to restore some light to the room. His surroundings appeared different, and he increasingly felt dazed. His attention was drawn to the table, the empty seat where Paul had been seated moments ago. Then, on the table, he saw that lay a dark covered book, its, its presence adding another layer of mystery to the already perplexing situation. An hour ago, Kenneth might have readily picked up the mysterious book and opened it without hesitation, but the recent hallucinatory encounter with his great uncle had given him pause. He could not shake the feeling that the book's sudden appearance on the table was somehow connected to to the surreal experience. As he contemplated whether the book had been real or a product of his imagination, Kenneth turned his gaze to the portrait on the wall. The likeliness between the face on the painting and the one he had seen in the hallucination was uncanny raising more questions than answers. With a growing sense of discomfort, Kenneth decided to postpone his exploration of the book. He would read it in a hotel, in a nearby town, or back at the university, far away from this unsettling atmosphere. With the book in hand, he made his way back towards the entrance, eager to leave this place and its mysteries behind. As he walked through the dimly lit halls of Lockwood Manor towards the exit, he couldn't help but entertain the idea that hiring workmen to initiate massive renovations and remodeling of the once grand but decaying estate. The manor held a profound and eerie history. It seemed like a monumental task lay ahead to restore it to its former glory. With the mysterious book tucked under his arm, he reached the massive wooden doors that guarded the entrance. The weight of his newfound responsibility and secrets still clung to the manor weighted heavily on his mind. But for now, he is determined to leave this place and seek answers and solace in the outside world. Panic crept into Kenneth's mind as he pushed against the ancient door, only to find it unyielding. He couldn't recall locking it or even closing the door behind him when he entered the manor. The realization that he was trapped inside this decaying, enigmatic place sent shivers down his spine. Who could have closed the door? Who could be here? Frantically, he searched his pocket for the three keys of the manor, but there were no nowhere to be found. How could he have possibly dropped or misplaced them? The feeling of being trapped intensified. Kenneth's thoughts raced as he pondered the next course of action. His frustration and anxiety grew as he kicked the unyielding doors with all his might, but they remained firmly shut. They did not budge a single inch. It was as though the manor itself was conspiring to keep him trapped within its walls. As he took a step back from the doors, one of the candles in the candelabra died out, casting the manor in an even deeper deeper darkness. Kenneth quickly replaced the extinguished candle. The overall dimness of the manor seemed to be closing in on him. With the eerie silence of the manor pressing down on him and the sense of isolation deepening, Kenneth felt a growing urgency to, to find a way out and escape this unsettling place. Desperation pushed Kenneth to consider another solution. He could attempt to escape through one of the windows on the first floor. It seemed like a viable option, as the distance to the ground outside was not too great from the first story. He hurriedly made his way to the right corridor, but to his dismay, the access was locked, unlike earlier. The left corridor presented the same problem locked. As Kenneth frantically checked the doors on both sides of the first and second floor, found none that were open or openable. Time seemed to be slipping away rapidly, as two more candles on his candelabra died out, melting away quicker and quicker. The oppressive darkness of the manor continued to close in on him. It was as if the light was sucked out by the darkness, leaving him with fewer options and an increasing sense of dread. The sudden appearance of a dull opalescent light from above brought a stark contrast to the deepening darkness around Kenneth. As he looked up, his eyes were drawn to a portrait that now stood out in the illuminated area. It was a portrait of an old man seated upon a solid gold chair. And to Kenneth's astonishment, the man in the portrait was unmistakably his uncle, Zacharias. The painting seemed to come to life as an opalescent light bathed it, and the image of his uncle gazed upon Kenneth with a haunting intensity. It was a surreal and unsettling sight, and left Kenneth speechless and frozen place, unsure of what this airy manifestation might signify. Zacharias's deep, cold, blue, unyielding eyes continued to peer down from the portrait above. Kenneth felt a growing sense of dread as he stared into the eyes of the deceased man. 
man. The intensity of the gaze seemed to convey a message, urging him to fulfill his duty, to read the cursed book that he had mentioned in the letter. The terror had gripped Candace's heart intensely. It was as if the very essence of his late uncle was compelling him to take action, even in the face of the unknown and the unsettling. The manor held its secrets tightly, and Candace could not escape the feeling that he was being inexorably drawn deeper into its mysteries. The accusatory grave expression of Zacharias's face in the portrait weighed heavily on Candace's conscience. It was as if his late uncle's spirit was slightly pleading with him to fulfill the long ignored obligation. In the consuming darkness that now enveloped him, Kenneth was left to contemplate his situation. The last candle died out, and yet somehow he could still see. All around him was darkness. It was as if the manor itself was toying with his senses, distorting the boundaries of reality as he saw it. Kenneth in his panic, searched his pockets once more, hoping to find something that could aid him, but they were empty. It was becoming painfully clear that he had fallen in some kind of trap, and the passage of time had become distorted within the manor's abyss. The morning he had expected should have arrived by now. He had been in the manor for many hours, but it was this unending darkness. There was no escape, no respite, and no light to guide him. With little else to turn to, Kenneth retrieved the black book from his pocket. Its pages were mostly blank, save for the occasional circle and drawing that held no immediate meaning. But in the center of the book, on the page that was marked, was a bookmark. There was a single sentence, underlining it twice. The symbols were, were old and were not in the Latin alphabet. He could read them without understanding them. They read, Dosto zai kai pneia me ze tesaris me he read it in his mind, trying to search for their meaning. For a few seconds, he deeply regretted never having learned ancient Greek. It was a passage he had been instructed to read aloud repeatedly, uncertain of its significance or the consequences it might bring. He could not help but glance up at the portrait of his late uncle. To his surprise, the one's accusing gaze had transformed into something more serene, even imperious. The change in the portrait Fritz's countenance filled Kenneth with a mixture of awe and trepidation, as if the manor itself was responding to his actions. Kenneth held the thin black book in his trembling hands. He hesitated to recite the strange words inscribed within. The room remained enshrouded in darkness, and the eerie glow cast upon the portrait of his late uncle Zacharias intensified. His heart raced as he considered the consequences of uttering the words. He couldn't help but feel a profound sense of connection to the manner, as though it were a living entity with its own will. The change in Zacharias's portrait, from accusatory to imperious, was a testament to the, to the mysterious forces at play within the house. The darkness surrounding him seemed to press closer, and the portrait of his late uncle retained its eerie composure. Kenneth contemplated his options, feeling a sense of foreboding about what might happen next. The weight of his great uncle's warning, and the mysterious aura of the manor's dark weighed heavily on his mind. Kenneth couldn't shake the feeling that he should heed the early advice and burn it all. Unfortunately, he could not find any source of fire, and the darkness clung around him. Trapped in this timeless abyss of the manor, Kenneth felt a growing sense of despair. He had no means to destroy the book, no way to escape the enigmatic darkness that surrounded him. The haunting portrait of his late uncle seemed to watch over him, its gaze unyielding. In this surreal and otherworldly place, Kenneth's choices were limited, and he couldn't see a clear path forward. He was at the mercy of forces beyond his understanding, and the weight of his predicament bore down upon him. Trapped in a maddening loop, Kenneth's movements seemed futile. No matter where he turned, he inexorably was drawn back to face the portrait of his late uncle. It was as if the very fabric of the manor conspired against him, compelling him to stay rooted in this nightmarish limbo. He cast a desperate glance at the open book before him, its enigmatic words taunting him, but it was still less unsettling than the ghoulish portrait. The silence of the abyss pressed upon him, leaving him was a gnawing sensation of dread and uncertainty. His resolved faltered. Whatever the consequences were, there seemed only one way forward. He could read or wait. How long had he waited already? Waiting produced no response, no result. Only reading would please his uncle, which he did not want to do, of course. The ominous silence of the manor and the unwavering gaze of his uncle's portal left him in a nightmarish limbo. He could not wait forever, and the weight of the unknown consequences of reading the words grew heavier with each passing moment. With trembling hands, Kenneth took a deep breath and focused on the book before. He had intended to read the phrase when he had read the letter, as he had planned after first arriving at Lockwood Manor. It had been 
several hours since then, and he felt a strange sense of inevitability about the situation. What was the worst that could happen? As Kenneth read each word from the book aloud, nothing immediately happened. However, in the depths of his mind, a persistent thought emerged at every word, whispering intently, Read. 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 He looked around him. Where did the voice come from? Nothing but utter darkness surrounded him. He slowed his pace of reading. The voice was now a yell. He bent in pain, staggering. The voice reached a crescendo of sound. As Kinnis continued to read, his fear and desperation grew. The voice screaming in his head had pushed him to the brink of terror. He no longer cared about the secrets of Lockwood Manor. He no longer cared about his legacy. All he wanted was to escape this nightmarish ordeal, to be free from this relentless torment. In the suffocating darkness, Kinnis slowed the pace of his reading, trembling with fear. The voice in his head had escalated to a deafening yell, unbearable crescendo that sent waves of pain through his entire being. Staggering, he clutched his head, was consumed by agony. His thoughts were chaos. Refusing to read the final word, Kenneth was now met with a horrifying scream of anger and rage was in him, his legs threatening to give way beneath him. Yet he managed to remain standing, despite the searing pain coursing through his body. Blood dripped from his nose, and his mind became battleground, his own thoughts desperately fighting the silence of torment voice. It was as if his very consciousness was tearing itself apart. The torment that seemed to stretch for an eternity, a deafening cacophony of pain, anger, and panic engulfed Kenneth. There was no escape, no respite. He longed to pray for salvation, but the words eluded him, forgotten in the turmoil of his mind. He would have screamed, but the sound would have been lost amidst the overwhelming ding of his own tortured thoughts. Amidst the chaos within his mind, a subtle sensation began to emerge. It was not a sound, but or a voice, but rather a distant, almost most tactile feeling, like a void, a chasm, opening far away from the crumbling fortress of his consciousness. It was something different, something beyond, beyond the torment he was experiencing. From the very tip of his leather shoe, Kenneth's left foot had hit something. In the lapse of movement, in the depths of his agony, something else existed. He bent his body. He used all the strengths and an ocean of time to go against the will that attempted to take him over, to control him, to usurp him. As he reached down, his fingers brushed against a cold metallic surface. It was a box. He shook it. It was a box of matches, the one he had dropped earlier. He did not remember dropping it, but he knew that he had. With his trembling hands, he managed to grasp it. The voice in his mind continued its relentless assault, but Kenneth knew he needed to regain control. Holding the box of matches tightly in both hands, he focused on his surroundings, searching for a way to escape the oppressive darkness and the tormenting presence that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the manor. Amidst the tumultuous battle of voices in his head, that distant memory became clearer and more urgent. Burn it. Burn it all, he whispered to himself, his voice barely audible through the cacophony in his mind. Kenneth's hands trembled as he fumbled to light the first match, but it failed to ignite, just like the previous attempt. The darkness around him remained oppressive, and his growing sense of dread threatened to engulf him entirely. He knew that his only hope was to find a way to create some light in this abyss, but his initial efforts were faltering. In the midst of his despair, the voice reached out to him from the depths of his own consciousness. He finally recognized it. It was and always had been Zacharias, his late uncle, trying to communicate with him. Kenneth's confusion and fear mounted as he listened to the voice. His heart raced as he heard his uncle's voice in his mind, urging him to read the final word. The shock of hearing the voice from this distant past filled him with a sense of horror and terror. How was it possible that Zacharias, who had lived too long, far longer than any man could or should speak from beyond the grave, the urgency in Zacharias's voice was undeniable and Kenneth felt a growing pressure to comply with his uncle's plea. The risks were uncalculable for him and the world. He could not help but fear the consequences of uttering that final word. Everything seemed to hang in the balance. An ancient, evil entity was its own will, waiting for him to make a faithful choice, a decision that would free it once more upon the world. Paul had been right all along. All should have burned. He took a match and struck it. Screaming voice made him fumble. It broke. It was a second the last match. Kenneth screamed. His eyes started to bleed. The world was red. The book was searing, burning his grasp. It was not a fire, but it was evil, and it did not belong in this world. The moment Kenneth struck the match, the world around him seemed to twist and distort. The agonizing scream in his mind grew louder, echoing like a chorus of tormented souls. As he intended to light the book, 
His trembling hands betrayed him and the match broke, leaving him with only one. Kenneth's terror intensified as he felt his eyes bleeding, the, the pain steering through him. The book, though not engulfed in flame, exuded an aura of evil malevolence an otherworldly darkness. He could sense it was not a mere object, but a conduit to something beyond his comprehension. It was a horrifying moment. Kenneth faced a choice, to attempt to light the final match and risk the unknown consequences, or to resist his uncle's desperate plea to face the continued torment of the manor. In the depths of the darkness, in the depths of Lockwood Manor, Kenneth's consciousness battled against a tormenting scream and relentless agony that engulfed him. Kenneth did not care. Bewildered, wounded, broken, mindless he was, probably upon the floor, trembling. Pain radiated through his nerves and sinew. Screaming words he could not hear above his thoughts. Blood covered him. No fire could be lit. He was no longer in control. His body and mind ensnared in the malevolent grasp of his great uncle Zacharias, who had somehow cheated death and existed in a realm beyond the comprehension of mortals. As Zacharias Correa's voice resonated through Candace's shattered mind. The ancient wizard's triumph was evident. He had not perished with his physical form. Instead, he had found a way to inhabit the very essence of the manor and ensnare his living kin in an eternal torments before usurping him, taking his body and leading his life once more. In the suffocating darkness, Candace's existence had become a nightmarish echo of what it once was. Trapped within the decaying walls of Lockwood Manor, he was condemned to endure their relentless suffering and the ceaseless cries that would forever haunt his accursed estate. He was a pawn in a game from beyond the bounds of time and human conceptions. The match snapped and pain flooded in his hand. The last match had laid in a box coated in sulfur and light flooded in the room. In that fleeting moment, the blazing light and steering pain, Canis's will surged, determined to resist the ma malicious grasp of Zacharias. As the final match ignited, the room was bathed in an eerie glow and the ancient wizard his voice transformed in a sonderous cacophony of insults and curses, lashing out in a frenzy of malevolence. Kenneth's vision was filled with the sights of the empty port frame, a chilling indication that Zacharias is broken free from his confinement was in the painting. He realized that the battle for his body and the fate of his soul hung in the balance. Despite the relentless onslaught of Zacharias's voice, Kenneth held firm, his lips refusing to utter the last of the cursed words. The formula remained incomplete, a fragile thread of hope in the face of the overwhelming darkness. In an instant, his hand was burning. His burning hand held the book, yet it did not burn. In his frenzy, he opened it. The pages would not burn. They would not tear either. The voice laughed diabolically. Then Kenneth saw in the darkness an outline. It was a sin man. As he approached, he recognized him. It was Paul. As Paul appeared before him, an eerie spectral figure bathed in an otherworldly light. Kinesis' heart pounded with a mixture of terror and disbelief. It was Paul indeed, but not as he remembered him. The apparition seemed almost immaterial. His suit was an ancient relic. His eyes burned like embers. In his black gloved, outstretched hands, Paul held the forsaken book, the very book that had wrought chaos upon the manor. The ancient trap laid by Zacharias to escape his death. Candice's hands gripped the bottom of the book, forming a bizarre connection between the two. Paul turned the pages. The pages, to Candice's amazement, were countless, far more than any book of its size should logically contain. Paul came to a halt, his spectral figure looming over the pages, looming over Candice. For Candice, it felt like a descent into despair, as if the book were a portal to endless damnation. His heart sank, heavy with the weight of generation of Lockwood, who had been ensnared by this malevolent force. In that moment of despair, something extraordinary happened. Letters on the blank page ignited in a mesmerizing display. They read, Ut ardea ob obscera mihi ad, ad hook vivo, emblazed an eerie, almost hypnotic glow. Kenneth did not need a translation. The meaning had imprinted itself directly into his mind. It was Latin, the language of ancient mysteries, and it whispered for a twisted power. May you burn, obey me, for I yet live. As Kenneth raised his gaze from the, the illuminated page, Paul had vanished. The apparition, a manifestation of his long-departed kin, had fulfilled its duty, leaving Kenneth with a newfound knowledge of a haunting understanding of the horror that lurked within the manor's depths. It was a solemn realization that he was now the keeper of this unholy legacy, tasked with destroying it. As Kenneth spoke the words, every syllable came with a barrage of attacks from Zacharias, as the fabric of the mind had been torn asunder.
He collapsed to the ground under the onslaught of pain, yet he persevered. Twice more he uttered the incantation, Ut andeas obscure mihi aduca vivo, and on the third repetition the, the cursed book burst into flames. The inferno quickly spread, its fierce tendrils consuming the book's cover and forming it into a molten, malevolent mass. Agony resonated through Kenneth's mind, but he did not falter. With determination he cast the book away, his voice relentlessly shunting the incantation. Flames leaped from the burning book, igniting the furniture, carpets, and the rotting, molded covered tomes in the vast libraries. The fire a cleansing force of destruction surged the great walls with relentless fervor. Kenneth's every repetition of the spell fueled the inferno. The one's dark manner was now ablaze with purifying fire. As Kenneth continued to chant the incantation, the voice of Zacharias dwindled. Its once potent presence reduced to a feeble, well, pathetic weakness. Kenneth's mind, once plagued by torment, was now clear and empty, purified by relentless repetition of the formula. Around him, the great manner was transformed into a sword swirling maelstrom of dust and smoke as fire raged and abated the flames had spread rapidly engulfing the entire building in a fierce conflagration kenneth remained undeterred his voice unwavering as he chanted the incantation driving the cleansing fire deeper in the heart of the manor kenneth's eyes stung from the acrid smoke as he brought his hands up to wipe away the tears he was only greeting by searing pain Buss's hands were burnt a cruel reminder of the inferno he had unleashed the agony jolted him back to his senses, and suddenly he knew that he had to escape. Staggering and stumbling, he made his way through the smoke-filled corridors, each step a torturous ordeal. Miraculously, the doors were still open as he had left them. With great effort, he crossed the threshold, just as the roof of the banner collapsed behind him, sending billowing plumes of smoke and dust and ash outside, crawling and half falling down the stone steps of the twin staircases that led to the ring road below, Kenneth gasped for fresh air, his body battered and broken, but his spirit unyielding. Lying on the mossy ground, Kenneth stared up at the pink and purple hue of the rising sun. His breast slowed as he absorbed the beauty of the dawn. His mind felt oddly calm, empty. Slowly he became aware of his injuries. He looked at the burns on his hands his battered body. It was as though he had been in a terrible accident. He needed help, medical attention. Checked his pockets, finding only a car key. With some effort, he got up. His surroundings a mixture of, of woods on one side and a chaotic mess of debris of wood on the other. It, it once had been a building, though he could not discern what kind? Where could he be? His hands aching, he decided to make his way to the hospital. Climbing into his car, he drove away. His past forgotten. In that moment, he could not have said who he was. Kenneth, Zacharias, or Paul. All was a distant memory, forever in the past, mercifully lost to the world of men. In the end, after months of relentless pursuit, one fact became painfully clear. Our patient has no mysteries to unravel. He was in a labyrinth without exit. Despite our best efforts, the man's identity remains locked away in the recesses of his own fractured mind, beyond reach and understanding. Hypnosis has offered glimpses faint and disjointed of his past. Those fragments only deepen the enigma. So there is no grand revelation, no hidden treasure or memory waiting to be unearthed. Instead, his psyche seems to be a bottomless pit of confusion and despair. As the psychologist assigned to the case, I am faced with the grim reality that the patient's amnesia was not a puzzle to be solved, but a void that defines comprehension. There was no tale of a cursed banner or ancestral secrets. There was only the tormented and shattered psyche, a soul adrift in a sea of madness. Our attempts of therapy have been in vain. The hypnosis session has taken us deeper into the abyss, revealing only more chaos and turmoil. It was a stark reminder that the human mind could be an unfathomable abyss, where sanity and madness dance on a razor's edge. Addendum. In... 1931, in the heart of the depression, the patient was let out after being identified as Kenneth Lockwood.